Okay, so I think we'll uh, get the show on the road. Um, Joaquin sent me something last year, and you never know when it's going to become useful, but I was looking at my notes this morning and it became useful. So I'm going to start today with a quote. There's no elite or avant-garde anywhere in the world, neither in science nor in the arts. The audience itself has become actor and audience en masse. Magazines have become something of a yellow submarine, a fantasy world, or the garbage apocalypse that resulted from the satellite environment. The end of the avant-garde, the audience as actor, the rise of global communication, and the demise of magazines. This passage, of course, sounds like it could have been written yesterday. In fact, it was written over 40 years ago by Marshall McLuhan, of course, who you all know, theorist of media, who was writing, in a way, a premature theoretical obituary for the magazine. Forty years on, the magazine, of course, has still not died, or at least not completely. Magazines have had a, a very long and important history in architecture, not just as documents for built work, and I think this is important, but as incubators and generators for the intellectual positions in the field. And the fact that changing technologies and uh, intellect, sorry, the fact that changing technologies, tools, and habits of communication have increasingly put magazines into crisis represents for us a huge challenge, but I think a huge opportunity. So in that sense, I think we're really lucky today to have Joseph Grima with us. He's been one of the key figures to uh, push the field to rethink how the existing spaces of intellectual production, in this case, the magazine, will be transformed by the forces of communication today. Joseph Grima studied architecture at the Architectural Association in London, and since then, he has played multiple roles in the field as editor, as curator, as writer, and as critic. And I think even this latitude of activity is itself a new mode of practice, which is very much worth taking into account today. He's the author of far too many articles to mention in a brief introduction like this. So I'll just note his most recent book, Shift, Sanaa and the New Museum, which came out with Lars Müller in 2008. From 2007 to 2010, he was, of course, director of the Storefront for Art and Architecture here in New York City, uh, a time in which he brought in precisely uh, new modes of communication, such as blogging, and brought them into the gallery as a, as a form of architectural practice. And I think that really changed the institution. As an independent curator, he's conceived and designed installations for institutions such as the Venice Biennial, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Triennial, the Architectural Association, and the Beijing Planning Hall. Currently, he is the director of the Istanbul Design Biennial, which will be opening in October, something I think we're all looking forward to. Since 2011, he's been the editor-in-chief at Domus. And I think he's really helped transform the magazine, not only editorially, but also in terms of new hybrid modes of practice between the existence of a venerable uh, printed magazine and generating new forms of online content and online interaction. So we couldn't have a better person to help us think about magazines today. Please help me welcome Joseph Greenman. Thank you very much. Um, we were just saying before how uh, it's actually there's a, a dearth of opportunities to talk about one's um, ideas and thinking and editorial projects behind the magazine. So it's a special pleasure to be here today, um, especially since New York was my former home and uh, coming back here to present uh, pretty much a year, or two years of work um, back in Milan at Domus um, has really been a fantastic opportunity really to reflect on uh, what, how, to the extent to which our objectives at the beginning have been realized and the extent to which they've changed, they've actually become something else. Um, Domus, uh, I think the thing that defines this magazine possibly more than anything else is the fact that everybody knows it. Uh, far more people know it than those who read it, in fact. So uh, there's this kind of a disconnect between the, um, the kind of its presence, its uh, authority, its, uh, its, it, it, its stature in a way in the collective imagination of the architecture um, field of architecture and the reality of its influence on the ground. Uh, and that's something that's of course difficult um, for the uh, editor to admit to, but on the other hand to some extent since I've been back there, my job has really been to try to 
um, remediate this condition and to try to find, to understand what are the channels, the languages, the modes of communication through which we discuss, debate, and criticize architecture today. And in a way to actually insert ourselves into those debates. And um, uh, as was said in the introduction, uh, magazines are something that we uh, at present are kind of painfully aware of as a medium which is in, uh, supposedly in decline. But the fact that Marshall McLuhan 40 years ago was already talking about the magazine as an, uh, uh, as an obsolete medium also tells us something about the fact that this is to some extent a cliche as well. It's something that is, uh, remains to be proved, the fact that magazines are actually going to disappear. Uh, and this is the, the cover of the first issue of Domus that came out on January 15, 1928. And it's, it's eight, that's something we're talking about 85 years ago. Uh, it's quite difficult today to imagine the extent to which the, the, uh, the environment that this magazine appeared in was different to the one that it's um, published in today. Uh, it was uh, at the very beginning of the modern movement, and uh, Domus was to some extent the product of the arrival of the ideas of, the, uh, of modernity in Italy. Uh, Joe Ponti, uh, Domus for Joe Ponti was in a way a, uh, a medium for something that was almost more like a, a crusade or a mission to bring modern architecture into the everyday life of the people and uh, out of the realm of um, theory and speculation within um, the realm of architects. And, uh, and that, in a way, is one, uh, uh, another defining feature of this magazine is the fact that it's always been a magazine with a mission, it's something it has an agenda. It's not simply about uh, carrying forward um, some news or, or disseminating information, but actually about uh, educating to some extent or, or uh, uh, a, cert a certain degree of pr proselytism, so to speak. Uh, and this is um, a quick snapshot from a um, navigator that we're developing for, for um, the website, uh, which kind of um, allows one to scrub through the history of the magazine to some extent through um, the covers and through the, the, the biography of its editors. And uh, Joe Ponti, of course, is a, a figure that uh, dominates the history of the magazine to an extent that I think no, very few other magazines for such a long period of time have been uh, dominated by a single individual. And then to the right, you have all the kind of multicolor um, uh, alternations. This is just in progress, and I, I grabbed it quite quickly so it doesn't have all the names on. Uh, but I think this is uh, one of the things that the, the magazine, um, uh, that's interesting about the magazine is that it has multiple histories, a history of being the reflection of a single individual, and then uh, having, changing dramatically and actually being a platform through which multiple individuals have uh, expressed their um, own ideas, have carried forward their own agendas uh, in a system that in many ways is more akin to that of a biennial. It's um, almost um, uh, seen as, in a way, an appointment for someone who has a very strong idea um, in, the, um, in, in its field, or at least it has been uh, historically from Mendini, who was the first to take over after Joe Ponti um, uh, passed away in uh, 1979 or 1980. Um, and Today, I mean, I could, there are many things that we could talk about. Uh, as you know, since um, in recent history, uh, the, the magazine has embraced a number of fields that go well beyond printed medium, which was its, uh, from, from decades and decades, for pretty much the, the vast majority of its existence, was its own sole system of, um, of uh, uh, communication with its readership. Uh, and of course, today we have a website um, which has become um, one of possibly our main um, form of uh, debate and exchange with our readers. I, I hope that uh, uh, all of you are readers of Domus Web. Um, I, I think it's much more likely that you're readers of the, uh, of the website than the magazine because, um, of course, it's something that re reaches um, everywhere and is free. Uh, we also have, uh, we could talk about um, the uh, uh, multiple events that we organized. We actually organized one here in New York last year called Critical Futures, which was a debate on um, the, the uh, idea of arch architecture criticism today, its relevance and so on, or about um, other digital platforms such as the iPad app uh, and so on. Uh, but actually, I thought it, w it would be much more interesting today to talk about the, uh, the most kind of, um, in a way, traditional and, if you wish, uh, least exciting, most boring, kind of most um, kind of conventional medium, which is actually that of uh, printed paper. Uh, and 
So think about Domus in a way um, from the kind of perspective, a, a metaphor that's often used by a lot of its editors, especially the outgoing editors, the ones who have had um, the opportunity to spend a few years there, uh, is that of a, 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 an ocean liner. Uh, an ocean liner which is incredibly elegant, incredibly luxurious, incredibly uh, almost overpowering in its um, dimensions uh, uh, and its kind of architectural presence, but at the same time extremely difficult to maneuver um, that what requires a huge amount of planning, even shifting a few degrees um, port or starboard requires planning from uh, many, many miles before. Uh, and I think that this, in a way, uh, uh, is actually interesting. This is a ship that was designed by Joe Ponte himself and uh, subsequently published in uh, the magazine, of course, which was something he was not too shy of doing. Um, and this, in a way, this, this idea of a, a medium of communication, a, 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 what is essentially a mass medium, as a sort of an ocean line, something has this kind of incredible inertia that will just keep going through the years, through the decades, kind of sailing on through uh, as the century, uh, one millennium exits, another one enters, is an incredibly uh, interesting idea. And in a way, uh, beg brings into question, I, I think it's even in an era in which every medium is called to, every magazine is called to justify its own existence, even today, it's very difficult to imagine a future without Domus. So if that's the case, uh, it's, it's extremely unlikely that in the foreseeable future Domus is going to disappear. So what, is it, what should it be? What is its role today? Uh, and in many ways, uh, again, kind of carrying forward this metaphor of the, um, of the ship sailing through the ocean, there's an incredibly interesting work by uh, a, a Dutch artist called Eric Kessel, who so a few years ago um, did an installation in a, a gallery in the Netherlands where he printed out every photo that was taken on, uh, that was uploaded to Flickr in one day, which is approximately one million uh, images. Uh, he printed them out and just kind of dis um, threw them onto the floor and created this sort of landscape or seascape in a way of, um, of photography, of images, uh, that completely overwhelmed the architecture of the space in which people could walk through and wander and dig and um, hunt around in. And in a way, this is really the uh, the environment that uh, coming to Domus, coming as editor, um, I, I actually previously worked at Domus um, for, before I came to here to New York to storefront for three years when Stefano Boeri was the editor, um, when I was straight out of architecture school, so that would, uh, I guess, 2003 to 2006 pretty much. And so even leaving to, uh, Domus in 2006, um, early 2007, returning in 2010, it was actually completely shocking how much the, the uh, context had changed uh, for this magazine. It was shocking to the extent to which internet had dramatically transformed the way that, uh, inter that architecture is not only uh, becomes familiar as uh, the, the, the uh, news and images and so on spread, but also the way in which it's debated. Uh, but most importantly, how the, the kind of the culture, our, our cultural attitude towards images had dramatically changed, had uh, really dramatically shifted and had become something that to some extent we really uh, take for granted, something that we uh, see almost as part of the landscape that surrounds us. And uh, I wanted to start by talking about this condition of uh, overwhelming um, iconographic surplus because it was really one of the first things that we, um, when we came to Domus um, uh, with my team, uh, in particular Salotto Buono and uh, Marco Ferrari, who is the art director, uh, we were kind of spent quite a bit of time looking at previous issues of the, magazines, trying, of the magazine, trying to understand what it means to respond to this situation today, what a print magazine, which by definition is constrained by a certain set of rules, its, its size, its weight, uh, its, um, its dimensions, its proportions, the page count, the fact that it's in two languages, and so on, uh, what exactly is uh, the, the what, what is the margin of latitude, what is the kind of room for maneuver within uh, this field, this two-dimensional field, and uh, we actually began by carrying out a study, kind of a slightly um, a pitiless study on some of the previous, uh, the work of the previous editors, not as a form of criticism, but almost like as a, as a graphical reading of the magazine as a, 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 as a, um, as a, a plane, as a, um, uh, a field of operation, so to speak. 
Uh, and we began by eliminating one by one. Uh, we, we, we identified three core um, uh, components of the magazine, one of which is text, a second of which is images, and the third being drawings. And one by one, we stripped these away from various uh, magazines, the first issues of various editors um, from the past. Uh, and what was incredibly interesting is that, of course, removing images and drawings, one's left with a substantial amount of text. Or removing uh, text and drawings, one's left with a considerable amount of space for images. Um, and the same for drawings. And this is a, a page that happens to be kind of relatively balanced between the three. But actually, when you put the three next to each other, uh, they, it actually becomes evident that there's a, a vast disparity between the presence of images and the presence of text and the presence of drawings. The, the image has come to really overwhelm uh, throughout the magazine, and this is something that was not a surprise in a way because the image historically has been one of those fields of strength for Domus. It's, um, it's something that very few magazines could afford historically, especially in the, um, in the post-war era. Actually, having high-quality photography of architecture was something that set big magazines like Domus apart from, the, from anyone else, because producing images uh, from faraway places and getting them into magazines was a vastly, hugely costly operation. Uh, whereas today, uh, in fact, of course, the, uh, this is a slightly, uh, if you will, um, anachronistic position, because of course the image is something that we've, that's been devalued to the point that uh, actually, uh, even just talking about text, um, it's, uh, uh, text is vastly more expensive as we uh, all know, or at least I know. And um, uh, drawings, uh, interestingly, are even more expensive. So if you, if you look through uh, architecture magazines today, you'll probably find that uh, drawings have been scaled down. Um, if at all, they've been very superficially um, re redrawn by the uh, editors and then stuck probably into some corner at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the article. Uh, and this was something that we kind of um, were quite interested in. And uh, it really kind of led us to rethink, in a way, the hierarchy between the different, um, uh, different forms of communication that was embedded in each art art article. And aside from that, we were really interested in the idea of the magazine as something that uh, could, in fact, have um, almost a, um, uh, what's the word, um, uh, not austerity, but a, uh, something that possibly today uh, a magazine like Domus, its role was introducing a new form of sobriety, in a way, to the act of publishing art architecture. Uh, if you think about so many magazines that have taken a strong influence from the web, that have been really uh, uh, dramatically influenced by the way that the web is kind of the hypervelocity, the hypersyneticism of, uh, of the internet, uh, we actually wanted to try to respond to that with a, some sort of counterpoint that emphasized the physical nature of the magazine. The magazine is something that has a tactile quality that in which uh, every element has been very carefully designed and is almost to some extent like a, uh, an archival um, uh, object, an object of beauty uh, that is um, on sale in newsstands, so to speak. So a lot of the work was really um, thinking about the uh, materials and the, um, uh, the kind of different qualities of paper, the different types of paper, the smell even of the paper, the paper that you touch with your hand when you're reading the cover of the magazine, uh, the way that illustrations um, could uh, convey a um, uh, uh, significant story, um, and of course the uh, kind of type, a lot of work on the typefaces, uh, but with a great sobriety that in, in a way uh, was a reaction against um, certain other magazines that had really kind of introduced an extremely aggressive um, uh, uh, graphic design that we felt was almost distracting with, in relation to the content and that was emphasizing the sort of uh, hyper aestheticization of the architectural artifact. Uh, but most, possibly one of the most important um, uh, aspects for us was actually the drawing, the uh, act of representation on a 2D, 2D plane, uh, and actually taking advantage of the fact that as Domus we did have the possibility of uh, treating the uh, drawing, the, 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 the uh, two-dimensional representation uh, with a degree of respect that few other magazines could um, attain today. And actually trying to bring that back in through a very carefully unified um, uh, form of representation that is standardized from building to building uh, so that these could almost become uh, like what the central element of, um, of uh, articles. Uh, so this is a, uh, a, um, an article from the first issue, 9, 946 of April last year, which was 
happened to be Stephen Hull's um, museum of, uh, in Nanjing. Uh, another element that we were quite interested in is the idea of representing buildings unfinished, not simply finished, perfect, um, uh, polished objects, but actually in the state of uh, uh, under construction. Uh, and looking at um, the process of kind of what's underneath the skin, kind of actually going beyond the, um, the kind of the final representation that we're also aware of, uh, looking very kind of carefully at um, the notes and the, the kind of codes uh, inside each um, uh, project, uh, and trying to really kind of uh, create an archive of um, uh, drawings that would uh, also be a tool to, for a deeper understand, proper understanding of how the building is. Um, <coughs> Uh, is really put together. Uh, and this is something that, um, uh, in a way, I think it's interesting that next week you'll be um, talking with uh, Matteo Guidoni from, who's also um, part of Salot de Buon, which was the team that did the uh, design of the magazine and who uh, also founded San Rocco. Uh, because in a way this goes hand in hand. I mean, San Rocco is a very theoretical magazine that's based on words more than images. But in a way this is a counterpoint to this kind of sobriety of understanding architecture as something that is actually not necessarily to be spectacularized, but that has a dignity of its own that can be uh, represented possibly um, only through a very careful um, uh, act of uh, drawing. So um, yeah, this is kind of a uh, few months go by. Um, and the, uh, I was asked to speak about a um, specific issue or specific text, and of course it's always quite difficult to uh, pick one uh, when you kind of there's a sort of uh, ongoing, um, unstoppable production, uh, monthly production. And uh, of course, I think that the magazine, to some extent, uh, it's up to the readers to, um, to define what uh, the agenda of the uh, editor is throughout the kind of whole spectrum of publications. But one that was uh, really an, a very important um, issue for me was uh, the July, um, sorry, June 2011 issue. Uh, which came a couple of months after the 2011 Salone del Mobile uh, in Milan. And one of the things that um, emerged uh, in this Salone, and that we kind of began to notice um, throughout the field of design, or I'd been kind of very interested in even before, the, uh, uh, before coming to Domus, was the emergence of a, completely, a com completely new paradigm of um, production, both theoretical and uh, actually kind of um, practical industrial within the field of design. Design, of course, together with uh, architecture, one of the defining, another defining feature of Domus is that uh, of all the architecture magazines, it's the one with the greatest latitude towards other disciplines. It's always been designed, defined by this very kind of multi-dimensional, multi-disciplinary approach, uh, which um, uh, interestingly is very similar to that of Storefront for Art and Architecture here in New York. So I really uh, felt very much at home in this um, idea of uh, a, a design magazine that is, uh, whose doors are open to um, the kind of uh, the disciplines, adjacent disciplines rather than closed. Uh, design um, and art uh, are therefore um, something that we deal with uh, quite frequently within the magazine. And whereas with um, architecture we had tried to kind of bring uh, kind of a, a, a slightly less um, aestheticized understanding of contemporary production, uh, within the uh, realm of design, one of the phenomena we've both been most interested in is the resurgence of a, or a kind of a new um, emergence of uh, paradigms that in some way uh, actually bring into fruition some of the ideas that were uh, first proposed in the 1970s, such as uh, Enzo Mari's uh, Auto Progettazione series, uh, which was in a way, a, uh, Enzo Mari um, is one of the great um, Italian masters of design, um, and uh, one of the most politically engaged. And in 1974, he published a small volume, uh, a small pamphlet that, uh, that included a set of, I'd say, um, maybe a dozen or 15 blueprints for building one's own furniture using extremely <coughs> elementary um, materials such as planks and nails and so on. Uh, and yet, giving these um, very humble, uh, self-produced uh, uh, items of furniture, some of the qualities of great design classics. Uh, and the series was called Auto Progettazione. And in a way, of course, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the cliche is it's the precursor of um, IKEA to some extent. And in fact, uh, Artec today produces a set that has all the kind of pre cut um, elements of the um, Auto Progettazione chair. But in fact, what, uh, what um, 
uh, this project and certain other ones, such as the World Bottle by John Habraken, uh, which was a bottle that could uh, designed for Heineken that could be used as a brick, a glass brick, when it was um, empty. Uh, these projects were really exploring, and of course many, many others um, of those uh, in those same years, during the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, the idea of, uh, we're exploring the idea of how uh, industrial production could be merged with the um, idea of something that is an open design platform. Uh, and of course this was completely, um, uh, throughout much of the 80s and 90s, especially in Italy, especially in the kind of the Milanese design scene, it was a scene that was very much based on the empowerment of um, and the, the pursuit of perfection through industrial production. The kind of the, all the, the great um, Castiglioni furniture, the Joe Colombo, the, the, all of these great masters of Italian design often sampled from everyday life, but ultimately were very much a kind of a, uh, a proposed a notion of the uh, designer as a heroic figure. Um, a, a great master whose work was a closed system. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we've been really kind of trying to um, uh, uh, investigate on an ongoing basis is the emergence of a kind of a, a revolution against this idea of design as a top-down discipline uh, and actually look at the emergence of a series of proposals for designers and uh, the, the role of the designer as someone who proposes an open platform uh, a platform of communication between individuals uh, that uh, allows for collaboration as opposed to competition uh, that has uh, that resonates with um, an idea of kind of um, collective creation as opposed to kind of the, the glorification of the individual uh, and of course this um, is possibly um, a little bit kind of is something that in a way could almost be taken for granted I think by uh, a certain generation that is uh, used to using um, Twitter and Facebook on a daily basis that is used to funding projects through uh, Kickstarter that is uh, accustomed to um, sharing pretty much every element of its um, uh, in, on in, in, uh, the kind of information about its own life but of course from the Milanese perspective this is something that is deeply alien deeply unfamiliar uh, and of course um, is possibly, if at all familiar, is going to be familiar in the realm of information, but certainly not in the realm of hardware. Uh, and uh, it's actually interesting that a few months ago the um, Economist did a cover uh, in which it declared the advent of a third industrial revolution. Uh, and the, what it was getting at was the idea that actually technologies had got to the point, technologies of rapid prototyping, of um, 3D printing, of, um, of uh, 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 new techniques of fabrication that were not necessarily uh, uh, tied to an idea of mass production where, as much as individual production uh, have actually, uh, what is implicit in this idea is that uh, certain uh, models of production that in the past were completely off limits um, and that Im implied the presence of uh, this kind of heroic figure of the designer uh, were actually now being deeply undermined. And of course, so what was interesting to us is to actually think about what are the implications for us for the design field? What, um, what are, how are designers responding to this? And one project that in this issue we uh, looked at was um, a project called Open Structures by Thomas LeMay, uh, which is in a way a uh, extremely um, exemplary, um, uh, almost emblematic um, example of this new design paradigm in which the designer is not actually producing an object at all, a little bit like John Hubraken's World Bottle. Uh, he's not producing a, a house or a, a dictating in any way what uh, the, the use, utilization of the subject is, but actually in his case producing nothing more complex than a grid. Uh, this grid which is actually intended to allow individuals um, to produce uh, multiple elements uh, that can, um, each one can be um, um, made out of different materials, can serve diff completely different purposes, but collectively can be held together by a, a certain standardization of um, proportions, dimensions, a, an idea of compatibility, almost like a, a sort of a, uh, how can I say, um, uh, uh, Esperanto for objects in a way, so that objects would be um, uh, able to communicate with each other. And what's um, incredibly beautiful about this is the idea that actually uh, pretty much anything could result from the system, uh, a coffee grinder or an entire kitchen set uh, and what is um, also interesting is the emergence of a completely different aesthetic in a way 
uh, an aesthetic of simplicity and minimalism, but also of accessibility and openness, not something that's closed and that you don't see what's going on underneath the skin, but that actually has um, uh, um, multiple possible aesthetics, but that is very much um, speaks of this uh, openness to adaptation and modification. Uh, and I think that um, even beyond the realm, the strict realm of design, this is something that's kind of increasingly becoming part of our culture that we're taking for granted that many fields, that is impacting many fields. This is uh, a project, an open source project that was um, designed to bring uh, into Wi-Fi networks, um, uh, high speed, high bandwidth communication to the city of, um, I, I don't think it was Kabul, but a city in Afghanistan where, of course, the um, uh, infrastructure didn't, um, uh, the, the, kind of the, 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 the municipality um, was not able to provide high bandwidth internet access throughout the city. So a series, um, a certain NGO set up a series, these are just kind of cut with a laser cutter, assembled and uh, replicated through a network uh, Wi-Fi throughout the city. Or uh, uh, objects that we um, all know, such as the Microsoft Kinect, that just a matter of hours after being uh, put on the market have been disassembled uh, a matter of days or weeks after they, um, they were uh, released, the, um, the, the, the code had been reverse engineered and now we all know all the incredible things that have been done with the Connect, or um, a certain kind of seminal projects that really opened the way uh, to all this, such as the RepRap, which is a 3D printer that's actually capable of replicating itself. Uh, and in a way, in, in that sense, is um, here these are all pieces that are necessary to make a RepRap, plus some tubes. So the idea of this kind of machinery that is completely open, that's completely, uh, and this is I mean, something that we all know in software we're all very familiar with, but uh, as The Economist pointed out, this is something that for the first time is really uh, undermining many aspects of the uh, industrial processes of production. Uh, so, and this is uh, a very kind of tangible example of that, is a, um, a project by Dries Verbruggen, a Belgian group called Unfold, uh, that created this little um, kiosk, mobile kiosk, inspired by Bruce Sterling's essay, um, Kiosk, uh, that is actually a 3D photocopier. So it has this little hatch on the back that you open up, put any object inside, and uh, it, a 3D printer replicates these objects. And of course, this, uh, the point is not so much to go about making Philip Stark lemon squeezers. It's more to actually make a statement about the, um, uh, about the replicability of, three, of design objects today, and actually to kind of question the idea of um, copyright and the, the question of the idea of intellectual property um, and to uh, uh, interrogate how design is responding to these. What new economic models are going to come out? Is design going to undergo the fate of uh, 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 the music industry, for example, which almost um, was almost wiped off the face of the planet by uh, iTunes where, because it was con obsessed with fighting legal battles with bootleggers. Uh, and so this is um, Thomas LeMay's um, manifesto uh, in which he draws a very kind of uh, direct comparison between the traditional model of top-down um, industrial production of the 20th century, in which, which culminates in the idea that the product is static, it's something that's closed, impenetrable, that can't change, that won't change, that doesn't evolve, and that is the product of uh, a designer giving an idea to an industry which then replicates it and spreads it out to a series of passive con consumers. Uh, and on the right instead, this new model in which essentially the product is uh, the outcome of an ecosystem of collaborations between individuals. Uh, and of course, if you, um, if you ask anyone who the, uh, uh, what the kind of, I, 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 the object of design par excellence of our era is, they're probably gonna respond the iPhone. Uh, and they'll probably be uh, referring to the kind of the glass finish, the metal, the kind of millimetric precision of its design, its simplicity, and so on. But actually, possibly what's most revolutionary about the iPhone, uh, and leaving aside a lot of the kind of extremely problematic aspects of um, Apple, I'm not kind of, this isn't a, a kind of plugging Apple in any way, but what's interesting and what is possibly what defined the success of this project is that actually the iPhone is the open system par excellence. As I said, it's not, in fact, totally open, but uh, so to speak, just kind of um, uh, pass me that one for a second. 
uh, because it's um, it's a <laughs> uh, it's it, it's in fact it's not a telephone. It's a it's a it's a it's a processor that's hooked up to a camera, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, um, a high resolution screen, all sorts of other sensors uh, that can actually be adapted to pretty much any use. You probably saw the YouTube video of the two Canadian teenagers who strapped an iPhone onto a um, helium uh, weather balloon and sent it up into uh, pretty much into outer space until the balloon. Um, burst, the iPhone had, with a parachute fell back down to earth. They were able to trace it through the GPS tracker and a couple of hours later the, uh, this video of what was essentially a homemade space exploration was online and they were uh, two weeks later invited to TED. So it's, uh, it's this, um, uh, and then, uh, so this is the, kind of going back to the um, issue of Domus, uh, kind of looking at this um, system of, that we in Milan in a way uh, this is a, 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 this sort of uh, heroic understanding of the design profession is something that is very kind of present and tangible in Milan, uh, and uh, uh, so this issue kind of investigated that in, in many ways. And I don't know if you noticed the, the, the thing about the cover; it's, <laughs> it's actually this um, uh, casino confiscated a number of fake Mies and Corb um, furniture that was, I think, it was confiscated somewhere in the Netherlands, and then um, submitted it to this sort of ritual. Uh, capital punishment, um, which was photographed, carefully documented, and then sent out with a completely straight face as a press release. So we actually received this in the mail, and my, I, my jaw dropped. I just couldn't believe that they were sending about images like this. And, uh, and they were completely serious, like this is what happens to counterfeiters of furniture. And in a way, this is a sort of, uh, so emblematic of this kind of idea that just simply by destroying counterfeits, the problem's going to go away. That's a, the problem is of course, uh, much deeper, and this sort of kind of Howard Rourke attitude of, uh, you know, the, the first writer is the writer of the ego that underlies so many, um, the, the, our understanding of uh, uh, design uh, across so many disciplines today is something that is, whether we like it or not, being questioned, and we're called to uh, question. So just to wrap this up, the, um, uh, of course, the editorial uh, is a sig particularly significant. Um, uh, we, we had to kind of find a way to really kind of take this problem uh, head on. And um, I was, uh, I, I spoke to Carlo Ratti, um, who uh, he's the director of the Sensible City Lab at MIT and has been dealing with issues of open source and um, uh, uh, copyright and intellectual property and so on for many years uh, in relation to design. And uh, he said, well, you know, instead of writing an editorial, uh, which would be kind of in a way a far too kind of conventional way of approaching the problem. Uh, why don't we do something different? Why don't we actually try to define what uh, open source architecture is, but collaboratively? Let's invite a dozen people or so from Paolo Antonelli to uh, Nicolas Negroponte and so on to actually set up a page on Wikipedia and, um, uh, and together we'll kind of thrash out what this is uh, and then that can become the editorial of the magazine. So kind of using Wikipedia as a co collaborative um, medium of uh, uh, writing platform. Uh, so we set up this page, opened it, began writing and so on. And then after a couple of weeks, somebody, um, a very diligent Wikipedia editor, flagged it for, um, uh, uh, for removal because it was not substantiated by uh, any print article. So the, the paradox of uh, Wikipedia is that actually unless something's in print that substantiates it, it's actually not considered to be serious content. So we diligently undeleted it, continued writing. It was deleted again, and then we undeleted it. And anyway, it got to the point when the print deadline arrived, so we just did big copy-paste and um, uh, sent it to print. Uh, and of course, the great thing is that a couple of weeks passed, the magazine came out on the newsstands, and at that point, we could actually substantiate the article <laughs> <laughs> because it was finally in print. So now it, it sits gloriously and legitimately on Wikipedia for you all to uh, read and edit to your heart's desire. Um, and uh, then Paola, later on in the magazine, um, wrote a fantastic piece, um, Paola Antonelli, on thinkering as part of her States of Design series. Um, which kind of explored some of these ideas and really kind of summed it up uh, in this quotation from Ilse Crawford, which talks about the relationship between the uh, designer and the consumer, the sort of uh, tripartite relationship between the producer, designer, and consumer, something that was in flux and that was kind of being really um, undermined. Uh, and so that was the uh, July issue, and uh, I think we can talk a bit more about that. And then since then, we've um, kept ourselves busy and continued to produce. 
Um, but I, the one th last thing that I wanted to add um, in relation to Domus is that for sure um, the, the website is our most powerful medium of um, uh, communication and debate with our readers. It's something that's growing incredibly um, rapidly, thankfully. Uh, and I think we've, we've found, uh, and that's something we could um, debate separately, that we found a formula that to some extent within the, uh, cons with the uh, constraints of what is possible reflects this idea of th uh, depth and thoroughness of the magazine that has this kind of glorious 85 year history on the web. Uh, but one of the things that whenever we're sending something to print, uh, I think one of the things that really um, sets Domus apart, or not, not from every magazine, but from many magazines, is the idea that you're actually in the process of producing an archive, um, a, a narration, an ongoing narration of the history of modernity up until this day. And uh, in fact, there's a library close to my house in Milan which uh, has every issue of Domus. And of course, Domus has every issue of Domus, but they're locked away in an archive somewhere. And this library is one of the few that has all of them, and they're actually on display. And it always completely overwhelms me when I walk in. The sheer kind of linear uh, length of all of the magazines stacked back to back is, some, is close to 80 meters long, I mean, like 100 yards of magazines. And so you have this kind of incredible responsibility uh, in producing this magazine, the, 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 the awareness that actually you're adding a chapter to a story that a story that began a very long time ago. And so in, in fact, this really kind of changes the terms to some extent in how we think about what should go into the magazine, what shouldn't and so on, because it's not so much about simply uh, dissemin disseminating information and informing readers or so on. It's actually about kind of building up uh, this sort of uh, ongoing narration of uh, the discipline of design, uh, which actually didn't really um, exist um, before this magazine did. And, and that's something that I, I always find um, incredibly interesting. How, and that's something that I think very few other media, the internet for example, will never succeed in replicating. And I think that in that sense, a sort of uh, beautiful ongoing story is something that only a print magazine can uh, encapsulate. Uh, so, um, uh, and that's really, uh, I think, why we still need magazines, why magazines, certain magazines, not all magazines, but certain magazines will live on and will continue to um, uh, exist. So, uh, with that, let's. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. I mean, we uh, invited you thinking that we were going to hear about the more digital side of things, and you did this incredible <laughs> yes. switch, which was to talk about print, which I really appreciate, of course. Um, and it's it's really amazing to hear um, just the kind of um, let's say deep history or long history in mm -hmm. which you're situating the practice. It makes a lot of sense, particularly uh, the way you've situated let's say, the open source manifesto in relation to the particular uh, climate of Milan. Um, and so I guess my first question would sort of start with that. I mean, on the one hand, uh, with an open source philosophy, let's say, um, you have a mode of production that does not necessarily have uh, a central figure or, uh, let's say, an editor. With a magazine, you have uh, a, an entity that depends upon having an editor, right? Mm -hmm. That has a kind of figure that takes a position that it acts as a filter. So I'm curious to hear from your own practice how these two seemingly antithetical uh, forces collide. You know? right. um, well, I, I think, um, as I said, when I came to Domus, my first task was really to set up a website. And mm -hmm. um, of course, that's something that's not particularly difficult to do. And kind of, kind of, there's all sorts of WordPress templates, and you can, in a matter of hours, put it up. Uh, but we, we actually decided to spend a, a significant amount of time on it. And we, uh, actually, it took eight months from when we really began to work on it to get the first um, proofs online. Uh, and I asked uh, Dan Hill, who uh, writes a blog called City of Sound, mm. um, who is um, at present one of the directors of CITRA, which is a research body in Finland that kind of looks at um, kind of the future of cities. 
uh, but who had formerly, he, he, he actually designed the uh, monocle.com and worked for the BBC for a while. And is one of those figures, kind of incredibly transversal <laughs> figures, that does, is an expert on everything from urbanism to web design and typeface design and uh, all of these. And so it kind of has that same, same sensibility, cross-platform sensibility that Domus, in a way, embodies uh, to think about what it would mean to make a website for Domus. Uh, and of course, Domus typically, like so many other magazines, has really tried to, uh, had met for many years, really kind of tried to wish the internet away, to kind of hope that it was going to wake up one day and the internet had disappeared and it would all be kind of back to the good old days when, uh, uh, unless you had a subscription to Domus, you had no idea what was going on on the other side of the planet. And, um, and then at some point, and, that, and this was really part of my mandate uh, and the reason why I um, was uh, given this job uh, was to really kind of project it onto the internet but in a way that was not simply just kind of following the lead of um, so many others or trying to compete on their own terms with the blogs for example which are, are kind of meant to, to, to a large extent kind of um, machine uh, CPM machines that uh, mm -hmm. uh, have very large volumes of traffic but exist largely on the basis of um, propagating news and information that comes from elsewhere uh, or uh, the strategies of certain other magazines that had very kind of tentatively, um, I mean, I must really hand it to the publisher that they had enormous uh, courage in embracing the internet and really going with a very um, uh, ambitious uh, proposal, which is what Dan and I came up with. And so, uh, I mean, we could even pull up the website, I don't know yeah. whether it's... Um, Why not? I could. Uh, yeah, we can get the. Um, <laughs> so we we really tried to think about what it meant for a magazine that had such a kind of a glorious tradition that had become synonymous with um, quality uh, journalism in architecture and design to, uh, to to be online. What does what does that mean? What what are, what is its potential? What are uh, what are the kind of terms of engagement? And uh, I really think that in, uh, Dan came up with a, a really fantastic uh, design that is um, extremely kind of um, free and modular and based on sort of a cascading series of um, articles, but that has significantly, when we went online, um, Typekit had just been uh, gone live, which was a service that for the first time allowed um, web designers to use, um, yeah, that should be good. Uh, that allowed web designers to um, hold on. I just need to get, pull up uh, Safari uh, to use non-standard fonts. So until uh, a couple of years ago, it was only possible to use a very kind of um, limited array of fonts on the internet. And uh, Dan's project was really a um, uh, an exploration of uh, what was possible through uh, typography, as much as uh, many other things. Um, Let's see what's going on on Domus Web today. But at the same time, of course, the, the kind of the law of the internet imposes that one has to, uh, one can't be kind of have the luxury of uh, posting simply one article or two articles a day. It has to be this, it has to some extent um, conform to the need to um, actually kind of publish, to keep a readership. Uh, publish a good um, four or five uh, items per day. And this is um, the, we're kind of a little bit um, squeezed here, but uh, anyway, you can kind of see the uh, logic. Let me see if I can get um, this. And that's, that's pretty much. It's designed for a broader, it's not really, doesn't work really very well on projectors, but so if you look at um, uh, this article, we have. Um, the Hertz of the Murin in London, and so on. And, and the, I mean, the great thing about the web is, of course, we can pr we can publish as much as we like. We're not constrained by the magazine that has uh, a dozen, fifteen articles. Uh, but you can see how there's a lot of work has gone into making a very kind of serious, um, uh, d d well-designed 
um, typefaces, uh, a kind of very um, carefully uh, coded set of um, uh, tools on the right hand side, all the kind of keywords and hyperlinks and so on, social media and so on, very large images, uh, which is of course something that we as a magazine have access to uh, uh, on a um, uh, regular basis. Uh, and so the, the, uh, this is really kind of to some extent um, really trying to and then uh, kind of commenting and so on. But beyond that, I think um, if uh, what, what I've been most excited about is the uh, slightly more, um, let me see if I can, do we have sound? And I think it would be yes. Yeah. Like we can, uh, these are some of the kind of slightly more experimental uh, projects that we've worked on. Uh, such as the mixtape series, which was really trying to use uh, things that uh, media that were not possible to use with a, uh, a magazine alone, a print magazine. Uh, look at, for example, how uh, sound could be one of the kind of uh, uh, mediums that we use to talk about um, cities. Uh, so this is a series we call the Domus mixtape series that visited um, various cities from uh, Rio de Janeiro to um, uh, Beijing. Since we're in uh, North Manhattan, I think we could uh, take a look at the Sound of Harlem, which was done by, uh, and these are collaborations between a DJ who, uh, or a musician from a particular uh, city and a writer. So the idea was always to kind of try and find a, um, uh, a way of a dialogue between literary production and sound uh, production. Um, and let's see if, uh, and it was a series curated by um, Daniel Perlin. I'll just, uh, and Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, um, who did a fantastic book, who wrote a fantastic Once book. I was far from my usual circuit, far being 127th Street near 8th Avenue, as opposed to 133rd and Lenox, I wasn't walking slowly, I wasn't looking for a story. And despite carrying on at a normal pace, with a normal attention to my own business, I heard an old man tell a short, yet complete, and completely staggering tale. He said, he kicked me in the head and I stabbed that cracker in the heart and he died. My daddy brought me here in the back of a truck. It's a long story, indeed. clicking here <laughs> and enjoy it later on. That's uh, very relevant to your um, uh, place of uh, present abode. So, uh, and that's a really fantastic mixtape. And we had um, um, people, it really captivated the uh, imaginations of many people. Um, a lot of really great writers and musicians and uh, uh, others um, actually kind of uh, agreed to take part. Um, and I think this is uh, the, possible, the realm of the web is so exciting because uh, it's actually possible to uh, uh, involve people in a, a completely, invent completely new formats and so on. Of course, the other thing is that uh, it's, it's possible to create a, a much more active dialogue with one's readership. Mm -hmm. um, so the point I was trying, I, was, I wanted to get to is that I think that print magazines, as I said before today, have um, their role and their um, existence is um, uh, in many cases justified. But to be absent from the web uh, in many ways means that even the print issue completely disappears from the consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's something, it's not this kind of false dichotomy between print or digital, but it's more uh, actually about a kind of a, a, a cross medium, cross platform um, uh, production uh, and the creation of an ecosystem in a way uh, which, uh, one of, in, in which one feeds off the other. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, what's been going on in the online platform, has that actually fed the editorial process in which is the, in the print platform as well? It's been a kind of feedback mechanism? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, um, I mean it's, a, it's a really a struggle. Uh, I mean, there are many, many kind of interesting little episodes about trying to run a magazine and trying to run a website. There's, uh, just to kind of um, recount a couple of them, uh, there is the uh, writer who writes to you and says, um, uh, I'd love to write a piece on... Uh, open source design and uh, 
uh, and you say, okay, well, that's uh, fantastic. Uh, we've, we'd, 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 this doesn't, doesn't fit in with our editorial program for the next two or three issues, so why don't we just do something on the web right away? It's absolutely not. No, I'm not going to even think about it. It has to go into the print magazine. Right. Uh, counter to that, there's, um, uh, there are people who write and say, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll write it for you. Um, you can do what you like with the print in the magazine, but I'll only write it if you put it on the website mm. because that's where I know I'm going to get feedback from people. Right. Um, then there's the uh, whole issue of funding because, of course, the magazine has uh, a, a long tradition of paying authors um, a certain amount of money, uh, which a website is never going to be able to compete with because of the reality of... Uh, the economics of publishing online and also the sheer volume of publishing online, the number of articles you have to come up with. If we, had, if we uh, paid the same amount per word for online publishing, then uh, it would be completely um, impossible to kind of have the same volume of output on week. So there's, there's all sorts of um, uh, interesting things and uh, uh, in interesting moments that um, emerge through being one of the few um, uh, pub, I, th I think we're one of the few magazines that really does have a, kind of a, a very kind of strong, uh, 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 high volume output in the design um, and architecture realm, and also a magazine, a monthly mm -hmm. magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, cause just just building a bit on that, no, because um, that uh, that uh, McLuhan piece that uh, Cray was talking about is actually published in a magazine called Print. Mm -hmm. no? called Magazines After McLuhan. You know? right. And McLuhan writes, understanding Marcus scenes as a scene already mm -hmm. in 1970. With a fantastic joke that was, of course, when uh, media become obsolete, they actually are freed and they can be artworks. Mm -hmm. They become a completely different field. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Which is, and we were just trying, actually debating in class, this particular, how this inertia actually is not simply dealt uh, with a cross-platform, but with a, a cross-platform that needs to have movement in both directions. You know? By the token that you have the mixtapes that you couldn't do in print, you also have a, a photographic portfolio that is carefully printed that, you know, with the kind of stuff that you can't compete in the web. You know? I thought that, that that was the kind of uh, curious inertia going around that you find a way of, you know, just having the audience going back and forth from you know, Absolutely. between media. I, mean, I, th I think that's the thing, that magazines more and more are um, called to diversify through uh, multiple platforms, um, even going so far as uh, the kind of the realm of events um, and uh, also kind of multiple, um, and Freeze is a fantastic example, which is mm -hmm. an art magazine that also organizes art fairs and that has um, you know, kind of uh, a publishing program in books as well, and uh, very strong online presence, and uh, and I think that's more and more the like, being tied to the idea of a specific sort of format or medium is extremely dangerous today. Uh, but what what you were saying about this um, kind of the, the being freed to become an artwork um, is extremely interesting. There was this exhibition at the New Museum last year called The Last Newspaper, which was. Uh, kind of investigating how artists res were responding, had responded throughout the decades to uh, news um, and mm -hmm. the, the newspaper uh, and how they were responding more specifically to its demise uh, to some extent. And of course the mm -hmm. uh, elephant in the room was the crisis at the, news, uh, the New York Times which um, uh, inspired the show in many ways. Um, but there's a, pr there's a, a very um, real economic problem which uh, we're kind of painfully aware of is that the magazine and the, the, the journalism as we understand it today is built on an economic model that is crumbling and quite how that's going to be replaced is unclear mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is something that's kind of on paywalls and uh, subscription discounts and this and that and the other and uh, I, there's still no convincing argument the response to that and for that's another reason still why the uh, idea of a magazine as an ecosystem is increasingly important because a diverse, if, if advertising pages are simply not going to um, uh, keep these uh, institutions afloat forever. So the, the, the open source still has to figure out how to support itself. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, th that's also it, it's, it's true. I mean, there's a very direct parallel between the uh, kind of emergence of an open source movement, mm -hmm. which has yet to, a lot of these designers are essentially living in a state of poverty and working almost as artists, mm -hmm. but without the prospect of becoming major international names the way that artists do, uh, and therefore being able to sell their work for millions of uh, uh, dollars one day. Um, and in the kind of in the realm of hardware that hasn't yet been figured out. I, th I think there's, you're right, there's a very interesting parallel there in, in terms of kind of news and information and writing and on the other hand the, um, uh, the kind of the, the, the current struggles of the design industry. Uh, I, 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 this is a question that um, I've asked several of these designers who are mm -hmm. kind of also ideologically engaged in the um, in the struggle to operate in an open system mm -hmm. and uh, some of them simply say that actually making money from selling objects a little bit the way if you look at the music industry selling mp3s nobody makes money from selling mp3s mm -hmm. let alone cds or vinyl uh, but actually it's the live act that is so that the music right. is whether it's sold or bootlegged or whatever has become almost like an ad advert for the live act Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think some of these designers are, um, are doing a, a similar operation in the mm -hmm. sense that they're getting um, uh, increasingly um, invited to take part in events, um, exhibitions, um, uh, teaching roles, uh, speaking roles, and so on, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that, of course, the blog, um, many, many mm -hmm. people use blogs in a similar way to actually can become well-known mm -hmm. on an international stage. Yeah. Um, through by outputting uh, content for free. Mm -hmm. so, so performance is becoming a simple way of you know, surviving, basically, no, making ends meet, which is, of course... I mean, I, mean, I think it, it's actually version. making... Um, it's more than, uh, potentially more than that, I and mean, it's yeah. really making a career mm -hmm. uh, out of um, performance and developing ideas. And these are all... I mean, I, I think also, on the one hand, you have people like Thomas LeMay and so on who are really kind of pushing the the uh, extreme, uh, the, the really the most experimental end of the spectrum, um, and then kind of making a living by teaching and uh, you know gallery exhibitions and so on. But then, if you actually think about the hardware industry, um, uh, and then Massimo Banzi, for example, who co-designed the Arduino chip that has basically changed the world to some extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's an example of hardware that is completely open source, and of course, anybody can make an Arduino chip. It's not. Um, but they've um, set up a company that's doing that, and then Chris Anderson has set up a company that uses Arduino chips to make uh, quadri um, rotor uh, drones and so on. So there's kind of all of these industries that are, to some extent, um, cascading from the uh, open source movement. So I think it's a moment of transition. It's not something that is necessarily. I think there's there's definitely careers to be made. It's just that actually designing that career is as much as uh, a challenge as designing the object itself. <laughs> Great. Let's open it up to the audience here. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. The first is always the most difficult. Yes. Um, I wanted to um, ask about your curatorial process. So what, um, how do you decide what's relevant today and how do you remain relevant? I, I, are you speaking about any specific, like for the magazine or...? Um, for, the, for the magazine content. For example. Magazine content. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, in, it's an interesting question. It goes back a little bit to what I was saying before. On the one hand, there's, uh, you know, there's just such an incredible deluge and overload of um, projects that are either proposed to us or that we find on a monthly basis that um, if we're uh, accustomed as we are to reading blogs and websites and so on, where we can easily con consume on a daily basis the equivalent of a whole ma edition of Domus, like making that very difficult choice of what goes into the magazine is, um, it's really tricky. Uh, and uh, I mean, on the one hand, it's um, like obviously the objective is to make a, a good issue, um, an interesting issue of the magazine that has kind of um, resonances between the articles that uh, is a pl pleasing reading experience, so it's a little bit like cooking in a way, where one has to not simply take fantastic ingredients and just slap them together. There's an issue of proportions and narrative and uh, 
uh, aftertaste left in your mouth, so to speak. Um, but, the, but then in the, in the specific case of Domus, it's also um, about kind of creating a much, adding to a much larger narrative. And I think that's why the open source issue, um, for example, really stays in my um, memory as one of those that really kind of continues this tradition of Domus of telling a story and kind of um, narrating the epical changes that have uh, throughout a century of history taken place within the field of design. Um, and so therefore kind of identifying also kind of intuitively, I must say, uh, what are the projects that are going to be kind of significant for some reason or another, not simply whether they're pretty or not, but <coughs> actually um, what, whether they resonate with a larger picture. Uh, and I think that, um, again, to take the uh, open source um, design issue, it was not so much the single projects, um, but it was how they all resonated together across a variety of scales um, that told something about a way that, a, a cultural condition, really. And, and so I think ultimately, it's, it's really about those projects that are less an end in themselves, but are more kind of um, offer key insights into who we are uh, ourselves, as, as people, as a culture, as a society, and so on. Um, so architecture and design, in a way, are actually more a, a mirror that we, the magazine, in a way, is a, attempts to be a mirror that we can hold up to ourselves to actually understand what the role of, uh, how design shapes us and how we shape design in return. Um, I have a question about the uh, open source uh, manifesto, the, the, the article that we read about it. Um, I mean, as much as it's poetic and beautiful and idealistic, it is. Uh, the pitfall for that might be, you know, it, to me, it's like a, you know, can open the can of worms that, since the designer, it has a very vague, broad uh, definition. Uh, I'm, I have a, I, I'm having a hard time and uh, thinking about, okay, if everyone can contribute to the process of design. Uh, how much good is that, that a product do for the sake of design versus uh, as much as it's good for production series and a production side of um, architecture? Um, just yeah, I, mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point. The idea um, that the underlying idea here, I think, is that we are convinced that today everybody is a designer. Like one of the cu fundamental cultural, um, uh, the, one of the premises is that uh, whether we like it or not, our, our culture today has actually transformed each of us into um, an individual with creative agency. Uh, and that's something that on a, on a daily basis, even simply selecting the apps that go on our iPhone, we transform that iPhone into something else. And it's an extremely elementary um, example, but Nevertheless, that is something that permeates our culture, is that we, um, we aspire to, we, we crave creative agency and um, systems that open. So the latest thing uh, I was reading in The Economist on the way over here, um, uh, that actually the latest thing is, uh, I can't remember what country it was, um, I think in Peru, there was a, uh, a, a, a some app with a pig involved that had uh, actually knocked angry birds off the number one position of the most popular game in Peru for a period of three or four months. And the interesting thing about this pig game, which I can't remember the name of, uh, is that it was actually made through another app. The, there's an app that's uh, for making DIY games. And with the, this guy made the game with the app, published as an app, and it became crazy popular. Uh, and I think that that's, the, and so apparently that's the ne next big thing in apps, is apps that are for making other apps. Um, and th this, is, this is really incredibly interesting. I think that uh, Kickstarter, in a way, um, is really kind of um, encapsulates a lot of the issues that you're um, pointing at in the sense that uh, Kickstarter pretty much allows anybody to get their idea out into the open and potentially get it funded. The result of that is um, some amazing, fantastic ideas that probably would never have got, with people who just don't have the CV or whatever, who'd never have got industrialized, put into industrial production prior to Kickstarter. On the other hand, it means that some pretty atrocious stuff is getting put made. 
and uh, putting out and and so it, it kind of it's one of the problems with democracy you know it's um it kind of has this populist um uh, element to it which um uh, is uh, unalienable and but i i i think that the the thing is that we as designers can't are not our role is not to make value, value judgments necessarily about uh, and this is where it's so interesting to think back to some of the projects of the 60s and 70s and the kind of um, ideas of Jonah Friedman, for example, and so on, where uh, it was really, or non-plan, for example, this um, Cedric Price and um, uh, uh, the others who uh, really advocated um, a very kind of non-judgmental attitude towards design, uh, design as something open rather than closed, um, not, uh, that, that it does not necessarily regulate it by um, uh, disciplinary uh, imposition, imposed, um, uh, notions, um, you know, I, I, I think that that is something that is becoming kind of cult absorbed into as a given into our culture, and I think that's something that's incredibly interesting for the designer. But at the same time, it's, it, it is unquestionably problematic, um, and it can potentially lead to also kind of an increased disconnect between different kind of um, uh, social strata, for example, just to name one of many problems: the kind of access to good design as opposed to uh, very sort of kind of um, slapdash. Uh, variety. Uh, yeah, as we know, the Donuts is in the process of transforming uh, from the focusing on the most influential uh, notions to a much more open platform for different ideas. So, do you think that uh, the pre previous uh, criteria, criteria of selecting, I mean, to select the most influential uh, staff, uh, design designers, and and the works? To present in the magazine, do you think such kind of selecting uh, is gone, or it also transformed into another form? I think the definition of what is most influential has changed. Um, that's that's the point. That um, one uh, until very few years ago, um, it was given that the most influential was the kind of the big name architect who had been practicing for a long time, set up a studio, and that kind of um, uh, articulated this. Um, uh, star uh, st uh, status of stardom, um, and actually now what is most influential is probably, and I think this is less the case in architecture, which has a kind of very long sort of cycle of um, uh, realization and so on. But certainly in design, what is what what counts as most influential is um, actually uh, changing dramatically. Um, and so I think that for, for that reason, I mean, especially in Italy, where there's a very specific, very precise understanding of what most influential means, um, th that has my, my kind of uh, definition of most influential has surprised a lot of people and uh, <laughs> probably uh, upset them a little bit as well. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also sparked a dialogue even within the kind of the Milanese scene, within the, the we, we did an exhibition in the last Salone del Mobile, Furniture Fair in April, a few months, a couple of months ago, called uh, the Future in the Making, and we um, took over this incredibly beautiful 17th-century palazzo <coughs> in the cent in the Brera, in the central district of Milan, um, with Tiepolo frescoed ceilings and so on, and stuck a, a bunch of kids with 3D printers and uh, a robot printing out chairs and so on, uh, and as kind of trying to kind of force the point that. Um, this three, third industrial revolution is on us, and either we're going to wake up or it's, gonna, uh, it's just going to overwhelm us. And uh, that, in fact, uh, what is one of the things that really kind of terrifies the industry today is, in fact, an incredible opportunity. Um, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. It was really, um, uh, we, we had some fantastic responses, some fantastic feedback, a lot of kind of what would have been considered the most influential designers. Uh, actually came and with, uh, it began a, began a debate and um, I think that's part of the role of the magazine is also to uh, instigate debate, to, uh, to upset in a way um, the status quo, uh, not simply to attempt to reaffirm it. I mean, just to follow up on that, I mean I think it kind of goes back to the first question which I'll try to re-ask again in a different way. Uh, going back to the narrative about Ponti, so when Ponti starts Domus for instance, he has uh, a kind of crusade, as you said, right? To affirm, uh, even to sort of bring into being a certain idea of modernism in Italy, uh, to carry it in. 
And with the open source position that you've outlined, I mean, is it at the point where you could say that you could define a position on architecture through open source? Or is it a position on affirming a particular process without yet being able to define a position on architecture? I mean, is there a kind of position that you could, could lay out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, architecture is the one that I think the whole of the design um, industry, the whole the design community is struggling with because mm. in a way it's, um, it's kind of been this holy grail for ever since the um, post-war years of, um, I mean, if you think about Team 10 and the, the sort of the splinter group that breaks away from CM, uh, that much of the, um, the, the kind of the, the debate and the, um, uh, the, the confrontation is actually centers on precisely these themes of the, the kind of the um, excessive um, authoritarian projection, pro projection of yeah. the architect onto the landscape and onto the urban realm uh, and onto the lives of individuals. And so then, of course, the kind of um, Giancarlo Di Carlo statement uh, that architecture is too important to be left to architects, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, an incredibly um, in uh, succinct um, uh, summing up of the idea that uh, not that architects shouldn't be involved in architecture, of course they should, but it can't be left to architects mm -hmm. alone, uh, and therefore that architecture needs to be a sort of a, a, a field of debate. But then you think about, um, uh, and of course the Smithsons and all the others, um, uh, Team 10 and so on, who kind of, um, uh, the various declinations of this idea, but then you think about De Carlo's own um, experiences and the, um, the steelworks, um, uh, residential units in Terni and how catastrophic those were in a way, mm. uh, and even though they were the uh, kind of emblem of, I mean, they, they weren't catastrophic, they were much worse examples than that, but <laughs> they were nevertheless not exactly something to be kind of held up as a, uh, some sort of um, new um, paradigm that's to be replicated throughout the world. Uh, and, and so, in a way, um, the, the kind of uh, uh, intentions, there's always been a disconnect in architecture, much more than in other disciplines, um, and especially today, I would argue, uh, between the good intentions and what is uh, practically feasible. Uh, and I think that ultimately, um, to a large extent, what it comes down to is that uh, we're, we're continually dreaming of a future in which cities are going to look dramatically different, in which buildings will look dramatically different, in which some sort of open source aesthetic will mm -hmm. emerge. Uh, but in fact, of course, the reality is that 100 years from now, cities are going to look pretty similar to how they do today, just as 100 years ago, Manhattan didn't actually look that different from the way mm. it did today. And um, in fact, what is going to change is going to be much more intangible. And uh, to give one example, I think that, uh, I actually think that the economics, for example, of construction of building and of, of architecture are one of the fields that are most likely to undergo uh, a, a change through the sort of the network practice of collaborative production. Um, the impact of the network on, um, uh, on the city is, um, and just as Kickstarter has dramatically transformed how a lot of uh, cultural artifacts are produced from films to objects and so on. Uh, there's, I think there's huge scope there and that's something already that's being explored in Spain and uh, in Berlin. In fact, there are some really interesting experiments on that because in fact, if you think of the, um, the urban landscape, the urban fabric, there's a sort of a script, there's a sort of a transcript of uh, the economic forces that regulate it, that have generated it. Uh, of course, today, the, the, uh, the, the, from the, the trajectory from the post-war era until the uh, post-war years until today has been a progressive marginalization of the architect and increasing dominance of the developer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that is actually finally, hopefully, potentially, possibly, God willing, uh, uh, possibly is something that could be uh, a, a territory that could be reconquered um, mm -hmm. through more sort of collaborative practices. But it's not, I was just kind of uh, thinking, you know, of the architecture from the city, to, from the spoon to the city. Mm -hmm. Most of the radical promises of the 70s were just jumping, erasing architecture, you know, taking just the spoon and the city. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And everything in between, you know, just 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 noise, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is actually happening, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. of course uh, there is a, a direct relation with the physical and mediated environment that applies more efficiently at the scale of objects, mm -hmm. and that really transforms the way we live in cities. Mm -hmm. So it really transforms the cities, you know. 
But architecture falls in this sort of intermediate weird scale. You know, that probably, you know, we might solve the developer or we might just, you know, erase it and take it as, you know, just a, a sort of a, a frame, a structure where we start hanging, you know, objects, ideas, practices, performances. You know, that is a strange... Uh, mm. Absolutely. No, I, mean, I think it would be fantastic. And I, mean, I think there are some really interesting examples on the urban scale already. Uh, for example, in Finland, there's this um, event that very interesting story. A, a, a few, I think, a year or two ago, um, a guy. Um, if my, if I get the story right, and it's probably kind of slightly different. The essence, the gist of it is that uh, a guy wanted to set up an ice cream van, mm -hmm. um, and in a little um, Citroen van uh, that was a kind of retro 60s, whatever, uh, wanted to transform this into a roving ice cream van that, for th through the duration of the summer, could kind of move around Helsinki and sell ice cream. So he started uh, to do this, obviously he needed a permit, so he started filling out the forms and then they kind of sent him from one office to the other office. Apparently there's no, this is not something that's contemplated, the, the, the possibility of an ice cream van in Helsinki or something, I don't know, it doesn't exist. Bureaucratic what anomaly. Anyway, so they kind of sent him a here and there forms to pile up and then they say, okay, well, this is going to take us six months to evaluate. So in desperation he um, says, okay, well I'm going to do this anyway. Uh, but if I do it, they're just going to shut me down in a matter of hours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a Facebook page in which I actually invite everybody to sell whatever they have to sell, whether it's kind of barbecued sausages or gazpacho soup or lemonade or whatever, from their window, from the barbecue in the park, just set up a stand on the, table, on the sidewalk and so on. And it's going to happen on this day, and I want everybody to do it. And uh, the page just kind of instantly became a phenomenon. And uh, it kind of transformed into this sort of uh, Scandinavian Arab Spring uh, <laughs> equivalent, where uh, on this day, the, the whole of the city, the public space, it, it, uh, the good fortune was it was a sunny day, and it, uh, uh, it, it completely took over the city for this day. And of course, all of this is uh, kind of technically speaking completely illegal because you can't sell food on the street to passers by. That's just not something you're allowed to do. And, um, and it became actually an institution which is now happening three times a year and mm. it's called Ravinta La Paiva and uh, people kind of incredibly ingenious like lowering baskets out of their windows mm. with croissants in them and, uh, and it's this sort of celebration of collectivity uh, and of actually reappropriation of public space. Uh, and I think that these are the kind of the ephemeral models um, that have incredible potential and I think a lot of the things that, uh, the three years that I was here at Storefront when we did projects like the Ring Dome in um, Petrozino Park outside Storefront uh, with Min Suk Cho or the Space Buster with the Ram Lubo guys, uh, which is this, again, a little van with an inflatable bubble on the back that could <coughs> pop up in the space of an hour under a flyover or uh, under an uh, overpass of the highway or in some disused space and transform it into an architectural space, an event space. Uh, I think those are the, this kind of extremely lightweight, uh, ephemeral um, architectural typologies are possibly the ones that are going to um, actually articulate these ideas most mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, there was just one. It was a, a fantastic question. Of course, how is the old readership of Domus reacting to all these, you know, <laughs> the age of feedback? You know? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the uh, I mean, the, the, those, uh, the age of feedback as in the online dimension. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, the, the, if I, a lot of them aren't online, so it's, yes. a, it's, it's not a problem because we don't know what they think anyway. So. Okay. <laughs> but uh, now and then they do get comments, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the thing is to t attempt to kind of roll over to a different generation and to mm -hmm. kind of replace the mystified um, readers with engage readers. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, back to the fact that Domus exists both uh, digitally and in printed version. Uh, I suppose that the website initially started as a complementary component of the, of the magazine, but uh, being so interactive and being able to host different uh, mediums such as the mixtapes or uh, the videos or stuff like that, uh, I, I think that it has evolved into a very dynamic uh, feature. And I'm wondering where the ba where is the balance between the two, and how do you imagine the future of the printed version? 
I mean, it's a very good question because the, the, the wealth and the richness, richness and the, the sheer volume of what we do online is, can risk kind of wiping out the uh, magazine and just kind of overshadowing it. But I mean, I th ultimately, I think they're very different things. Um, and as I was saying before, I think that if you, if you have a magazine, um, you know, kind of nowadays you have to have a website. I think that's something we can kind of take for granted. Um, if you don't have a website, then the, the magazine is kind of um, going to disappear anyway. Um, and if you do have a, a website, you have a platform for communicating with your readers. Um, the magazine is a very, I mean, ultimately, it's, we're, we're very much aware, especially outside of Italy, it's a luxury item. It's expensive. It has um, a certain kind of uh, weightiness to it um, in every sense, economic and uh, physical and so on. Uh, but it, it, Domus is one of those magazines that I think um, has a value as a, uh, a kind of a high quality reading experience and uh, simply the, the pleasure of actually um, touching these pages and the, 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 the sort of the attention that's put into every detail of it is something that um, certain readers appreciate um, even, uh, even though I think um, of course there's a di generational disconnect to some extent but um, I think that that's, um, that's changing. Uh, and on top of that, it's something that, of course, has a value as a sort of a, um, obviously it's not peer-reviewed, but it's almost kind of an official journal of the discipline. So many architecture practices, for example, have been subscribing for 20, 30, 40 years. Many libraries have it as a sort of a record of sorts. Um, and the great thing about it is that it can afford to uh, commission texts of such incredible depth and a kind of analytical brilliance that very, very few websites are able to match. And of course, we can ourselves play with uh, commissioning for the magazine and then putting it online for free and so on, but that's kind of almost in the, kind of the beta phase, it's a test phase, uh, and the internet in general and us specifically have to really kind of figure out the economics of this I and mean, how we're going to the magazine is not forever going to be able to subsidize free content on the internet, so how are we going to deal with that? Uh, and that's something that we're really um, kind of thinking about now as well. It is, uh, it is very amazing that uh, see Domos have two different platforms that uh, can let different designers perform on it and also trigger many activity between them and my question is that in your mind and is there um, will be any other platform will happen in Domos? Uh, well we have um, obviously kind of social media quite a, uh, a significant um, presence in social media quite active in that but uh, we're going to be launching in September uh, an iPad app uh, which is, um, in a way, kind of positions itself halfway between the two. Uh, it's a, uh, it has all of the content of the magazine, but of course it's accessible everywhere in the world because one of the problems with the magazine is distribution because it's so big, heavy, expensive, and so on. Um, and uh, that's something that we're um, uh, working on at present. Um, the, of course, iPads are very. They, they kind of tend to unify, uh, they're very kind of flattening, they flatten uh, everything, there's no kind of discrepancy in size, there's no discrepancy in materials, it's just every magazine is the same size, every magazine is the same. Uh, of course you can play with the design a little bit, but it, it cancels out a lot of those defining, those things that make Domus different, for example this kind of quite large size that has been the same for every issue since 1928. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's just never been questioned. Uh, so we're, we're really kind of also, I think like many others, trying to understand what would make Domus, what would be the kind of the value of Domus on, uh, on there, that what, what can we bring to that that um, is going to uh, really kind of interest our readership. And so we've been focusing on uh, long form articles, like l articles that are quite long in depth which um, is something that there isn't that much of in uh, architecture at the moment. There tend to be a, kind of a lot of, kind of quick commentaries and so on, uh, debates and op-eds and so on. Uh, but beyond that, I think um, we'll also, I, I can uh, really imagine that we'll be um, expanding also in the field of events and um, exhibitions 
um, and kind of summits of various kinds. That's something we're, we're reflecting on at the moment. Um, but I think increasingly there has to be, we live in an age of experience economy, as the music industry has showed us. So um, this is something that I think we need to deal with as well, somehow. And uh, that's, that's definitely kind of been the, on the cards for the next couple of years. I make a question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you and uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is, is a series of great questions and great answers. Uh, I'm kind of uh, astonished by the fact that uh, you have a stream precision in uh, describing formats. You talk about the type of paper you're using, the size of the fonts, the most uh, kind of complex and means uh, even like the, the templates of WordPress that you're using, all the kind of careful definition of the format uh, and, you know, extremely, uh, uh, how this transformation actually is actually driving your, your approach to the, to the magazine and also kind of adjust to a certain uh, technological shift, but also kind of production shift and, as you know, a kind of um, crowd, from crowdfunding to, to open source. Uh, and then uh, after uh, Craig asked uh, several times, so what about the content shift? Uh, this, the few words that you mentioned were extremely traditional. You end up saying, well, it's a matter of intuition and maybe say haste and maybe you didn't mention like that. So I wonder, because when you look at the magazine, I don't think that's the case. I mean, when you, one looks at your issues on the magazine and you compare it with the previous one, Stefano or even Mendini's, that is kind of a weird moment, but you know, I think one can tell that it's a shift, it's a shift of the interest in what appears in the pages. Of course, that's, you know, your metaphor or the metaphor of the boat is great. Of course, it's a magazine that is heavy and difficult to maneuver and there is some content that has to be there, but, um, but still there is a shift and I, I would like you to be more explicit about it because because I think it's there, and you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, in, it's necessary to know a little bit more about that. I think the thing is that there is no, um, it's not possible to define a, a sub, the, the, there is no kind of grand plan behind this magazine in the sense that we're um, attempting to enact some kind of um, uh, uh, precise agenda. Uh, the magazine reflects the interests of an individual, which are largely myself, um, which is fantastic because it, uh, we still enjoy this kind of condition of um, total authoritarian uh, projection onto our long-suffering readers. Um, but I think it's also possible to, uh, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm sorry if it came across that way because uh, in fact, the most important point for me is that the, the magazine is a reflection on, and all I aspire for it to be, is a, uh, an investigation into who we are using design as a language. And I think that that's really all there is to be said. And I think that in this particular moment, what interests me the most is actually thinking about issues of property and authorship and economic um, structures and so on, and to try to kind of investigate those to the degree that they're possible. I think that's by far the most um, interesting field of innovation in the realm of design today. Uh, and in fact, that's what um, Istanbul uh, Biennial is also um, really looking into. Um, I don't think that in architecture there is, I, I think there's a lot to be documented. I don't think there's anything dramatically exciting going on that I can kind of claim to be uh, sort of overwhelmed by the, the new, I mean, I think there are great things happening, but it's not so um, incredibly exciting um, as a, uh, in this particular moment of its history. I think there were other moments where it, when it was the kind of playing, playing the lead role. Um, design as a broadly defined discipline is the one that excites me the most. I think it's the one that cha is changing the most um, in some ways, but of course architecture is simply one aspect of design. Uh, and the, the magazine is not kind of, I, I, I do think there's a kind of a degree of, um, Domus in particular, uh, 
attracts a certain kind of um, arrogance in its uh, editors where they kind of think that they can have some sort of grand editorial plan that is going to somehow uh, transform the, um, the, the history of design to some extent or architecture. And I, I disagree with that. I think that what is fundamentally important for the magazine today um, is to build um, and what we've been really trying to do and why I've placed so much emphasis on the platforms is to build up a, um, to kind of regain a sort of a, uh, a dialogue with a broader readership because uh, of course you and me and a, a bunch of other people in this room know um, the kind of the, the relatively subtle differences between or, or even significant differences between the different editorships but that is something that um, I, I do kind of think it's uh, problematic that it's so limited the 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 kind of the the range the community that we speak to and in and so in 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 fact the kind of the the attempt has been to on the one hand build up this sort of kind of creative community again around domus um using these new platforms and on the other hand um introduce a series of provocations and debates uh, and there are several of them and i i kind of chose to focus on one which was the kind of the whole issue of open source and questioning propriety and uh, uh, authorship and so on. Uh, there are other regarding kind of much more kind of <coughs> geopolitical issues, such as um, the kind of fortification of Europe. Uh, we did a call for ideas for, uh, uh, as you know, for a, um, uh, an infrastructural connection between the African continent and the European continent uh, as a consequence of having noted that um, these are actually the only two continents which not only are not connected in any way infrastructurally, but are also, there's no even, there's not, a, uh, at the time there was not even a plan to connect them infrastructurally. So, there, I mean, we, we, we've taken a series of, I mean, I think Domus has a history also of kind of ideological engagement, and that's something that we um, have attempted to kind of carry forward. Uh, but without kind of turning it into something that's a little too rhetorical because I, I think it has, uh, it, it kind of attracts a certain sort of um, rhetorical indulgence which I find unfortunate. Uh, and I, I uh, also I think it's my kind of British upbringing that kind of um, tends to uh, uh, suppress the, the or I, 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 I would like to think that it suppresses the kind of projection of individual too strongly. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that's, that's my kind of two cents on the subject. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the, like, in the geopolitical aspect of the magazine, and especially uh, about the fact that you do have different issues in different countries. So, and uh, I'm wondering, like, first, those all the issues are created in Milan, and also, is, I'm sure, like, uh, they must be interpreted really differently from one country to another, and also from one language to another one. So. I just would like to know more about those issues. Yeah, the, the, there are, I think, six um, local editions of Domus that are collaborations between Domus and um, local publishing companies. And there are China, Israel, Russia, Persian Gulf, um, Central America, and India, and most recently Mexico, which just started um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and each of these, in a way, is um, uh, the, the format <coughs> is pretty much always that 60 or 70 percent of the magazine comes from Milan, um, is kind of sent from uh, us, and then 30 or 40 percent is local specific content that is developed by local editors. Uh, and so it's, it, it, I mean, uh, one of the, the things about Domus is that it's always, it, it, its, its role has tr changed a lot over the years. Um, we kind of take for granted today that it's a bilingual magazine, Italian and English, but actually it has, uh, that has actually not always been the case until the 1950s or maybe even 60s, it was only in Italian. And it was very, it was read pretty much only, well, not pretty much, it was read only by Italians and it dealt with the Italian condition, the Italian situation. Then for a period, I think it was even in four languages, there was also um, French and German. And then 
in the 1970s, it stabilized on this Italian-English um, model, uh, which was largely a consequence of the fact that it was a, uh, it, Italian design became uh, very popular internationally, largely as a consequence of an exhibition here at MoMA, uh, the new um, domestic landscape. Uh, and so Domus became, in a way, the uh, portavoce, the mouthpiece of the Italian design industry and um, design community. And, uh, and so, therefore, it was that tied very much to this boom, uh, this kind of period of excellence in um, production. Uh, but since then, of course, um, and especially since this kind of idea of rotating editors and international editors um, took place, it's became one of the most international design magazines that doesn't deal with any specific condition. Uh, there are um, a few others, of course, but it's, it, it really kind of deals with, it's become almost a, a product of the era of global architecture, um, or has adapted to that. So the magazine that we edit is actually not specific to any, we don't publish particularly more Italian architecture than anything else. In fact, I think in the last year we've published a lot more Spanish architecture than Italian architecture. Um, which tells you a lot about the situation of contemporary uh, architecture in Italy. Uh, but the, um, it's, the, and that, that's, uh, that's actually kind of an interesting um, thing for me, is the idea that we're producing, we're almost like a, a kind of a central repository that's then being kind of sampled. And it's, it's always really interesting to see what the different local editions select, uh, what they pick to publish in their own um, uh, local um, areas. And, I mean, I, I think there's obviously certain problems with this that you're kind of, uh, it's about as far as you could get from Kenneth Frampton's critical regionalism. It's like literally the, the uh, opposite of this. It's like a, to some extent propagating a very kind of global uh, ageographical view of architecture. Um, but that is actually a reality of contemporary practice. Um, in the first issue of the magazine, we did this, we drew a map where uh, it happened to coincide with the publication of um, an essay by Beatrice Colomina on uh, about Le Corbusier as the first global architect of the jet age, who, uh, for him, the, the arrival of the jetliner, the, air, the, the uh, jet aircraft, really transformed his practice because he became practicing uh, all over the world. Uh, so we actually reconstructed all of his trips in a given year, um, which I think was 1956 and compared them to the travels of the other architects who were published in the same issue. And it was um, really interesting to note that, in fact, the model that he, was pi that he pioneered in the 1950s uh, was, um, has been kind of become normal practice. It's completely normal for any architect today to be publishing, to be um, building in maybe two or three continents. Uh, and in, in a sense, Domus has um, uh, is a product of that um, transformation in architectural practice today. Uh, and so, and also through this kind of global network of magazines um, uh, has really reflects that, I think, more than any other um, architectural publication. Hi, uh, as soon as, um, over the years, obviously, the number of people who've been subscribing to magazines has been reducing, but as soon as your website came out, was there a significant reduction in the number of people who've subscribed? Because on your, your website displays the current edition of the magazine, but uh, the previous editions haven't been archived. So it seems like the only way of keeping a record and archiving your magazines are to, to buy them. Yeah, there's, there's no um, noticeable correlation between the uh, website and the um, sales, to be honest. I, mean, I, I think the, if anything, it's the opposite because we've been able to communicate the, the magazines more efficiently. So, but it, it hasn't, I, I don't think, um, they, they, the word they use in the publishing industry is cannibalization, like one. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, which I've been, it's a word I've heard a lot recently, but uh, I, d I don't think it's, it's, it, um, it's not as simple as that, for better or for worse. It could, I mean, it would be nice if it were that simple, but it's, 
uh, it's a lot more complex. In fact, it depends on all sorts of. <coughs> presumably, I mean, I'm, I'm not also, I'm, not, I'm no expert on that specific um, aspect of it. So. Great. Well, uh, I think we could go on and on all uh, evening, but uh, in the interest of uh, getting us all to the next destination, I will uh, just ask you all to help me thank uh, Joseph for your talk today.